very happy to have Ron Basio, who as you can see is a senior project manager. I'm not sure how much that means to you because you've read a lot of the standards and things like that, but exactly what the FASB uh, may be a little bit foreign to, to a lot of people. But uh, Ron's going to talk to us a little bit about the conceptual framework. Uh, he's open to questions. I hope you'll ask him. He's going to talk a little bit about the, um, some of the programs that the FASB has um, for uh, after you graduate. He might be interested in those. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ron. For the uh, State Society of CPAs, and I said, geez, my flight gets in here at around 3.30, 4 o'clock. I wonder if there's any students that would be interested in hearing anything about what we do at the FASB. So I expected a small group, a bit much bigger turnout, but hopefully you kind of all relaxed and feel free to ask whatever questions you have. One of the things I wanted to do is try to give you a sense of what our board members struggle with when they go through a project. Many of you will probably be out in public accounting, in academe, with a law firm perhaps. Uh, we'll have opportunities perhaps to comment on some of the proposals that we're working on uh, at various times and tell us whether, whether it's good stuff or whether it's just nonsense and we should pack it up and maybe think about a different approach. Uh, but having some understanding of what the board goes through when you are uh, taking that opportunity to comment on any proposals will give you some insight. And then I also do want to, at the uh, tail end of this, kind of cut through some of this, but I want to relate it to leases, which is a current project. And most of you have probably you know, looked at Statement 13, I guess, was the old day be before we had the codification. I'm still an old timer and refer to the old statement numbers. Uh, but now we have the codification. But you, you look at leases, and it's often been criticized for bright line rules, and that people game the rules. And, you know, in effect, we see snow fences where it seems like all the leases are just up around the fence where the line is drawn for whether you get operating or capital. And you know, a lot of that structuring goes on. And a number of years ago, the SEC's Posen Committee uh, sent a list of issues to the board to address. And some of them were basically under the big bucket of off-balance sheet financing. And the criticism on leases is that there's many long-term con long contracts. And you know, the typical example has been Somebody's got a rental for the airplane engine, somebody's got a rental for the plane, somebody's got a rental for another part, but nobody has the plane. And, uh, you know, and the, the concern was, well, everybody's structuring to get an operating lease treatment, nobody's got anything, on, no asset on the balance sheet. And so it's a difficult project, um, and it raises some difficult issues. And the conceptual framework is what the board uses to try to think through projects. The, uh, one of my mentors was Reed Story, who came out of academe, was with the AICPA research, and he did some writings. Uh, and there's a nice little booklet that, that Reed and his daughter co-wrote uh, for us that kind of goes through the background and the history of the conceptual framework. But he has this kind of in there, this like list of kind of questions. You know, what's the order that we should be asking our questions? And he thinks, you know, the order is start with, well, what's the asset? You know, if you're studying an issue, what's the asset? What's the liability? Did an asset or a liability change in value that we have a recognition event to deal with? Um, what was the cause of the change? Was it a revenue item, an expense item, transaction with an owner? Uh, it's sort of a list of the questions. So it, it basically starts with what we've been calling the anchor, the asset definition, the liability definition. So yeah, you've got to ask what is the asset, but you know, I kind of get it, say, well, think about it in the right sequence and kind of go through it. And Lisa's is posing that question. Uh, you've got contracts for the use of property, but what is the thing that you think is off balance sheet? So we've got two examples that we've used. We've got the, the use of a building, um, sometimes 30-year leases, sometimes three-year leases, uh, sometimes 
all of a floor, all of a building. Sometimes just a small suite within a building. And we got automobiles where it's typically the entire automobile that you're leasing, not just a little portion of the asset. And it may come with bumper-to-bumper -bumper service. Even the space in the building may come with services. So we get the examples and say, well, what is it that we have? And we know we have contracts, because somebody put the word leases at the top of the contract. Well, we got contracts. We have lots of contracts. I'm sure you've all gone through business law, ancient history for me. But we've got lots of contracts. We're trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with the contract? What is it that we have? The board's been focusing on this right of use model and saying, well, the contract is giving us a right to use some underlying asset. Uh, whether it's the space in the building or it's the, the entire car for a period of time. Um, and the contract's obligating us to make the lease payments. The present practice, we don't put an asset or a liability for an operating lease. If we cross the threshold for capitalization, we do put an asset on and a liability. But again, uh, some would say the line for that is just arbitrary and, and is, is gamed. Um, I personally, and you know, the, I, I don't know that you guys have the handout or the material that the slides are, but the first slide had a little disclaimer. It says, you know, the views expressed here are just those of the presenter, not the board. Uh, I want to remind you that, because I'll express some views. You know, we've been arguing the right of use I'm not so sure it's a right of use, but it basically gets back to what's the right question to ask, or whether it's a right to receive use in exchange for an obligation to make a payment. So I don't know whether two parties both have some kind of rights, but I think that's a rather you know, hair split kind of thing. There's some kind of rights, and everybody would say it's sort of an intangible right that's coming from the contract. Whether it's a right to use or a right to receive the use, but I, I pose that question as to well, is it more of a receivable, or is it more of a kind of a tangible asset? Because we think about the underlying, and the only reason I bring that up when I talk to your staff members on this is I say, well, the way we think about measuring an asset is the way we think about what the asset is. So if we think of property, plant, and equipment, we kind of measure that one way. If we think of receivables, we tend to measure that in another way. So thinking about what is the asset will help us understand, well, if that's the asset, how must we measure it to comply with GAAP? And then maybe how should we measure it if we try to think about improving on GAAP? Because we shouldn't get necessarily get locked in our ways. Now, one of the reasons I like to talk to this kind of a group is you guys are not burdened with all this baggage of this is the way we've been doing it, must be right kind of stuff. You come at it with fresh minds, hopefully open thinking. But I think thinking about what is the, what is the right or the rights is the important question on leases. And the board struggling with this. Uh, the board has been pushed again by the SEC to try to get some things on the balance sheet on the, on the sense that we're, we're missing things. So in the building example and in the auto example, we kind of look at it and we kind of look at the items and you kind of look at what's the right and then you got all of those other little things, the parking spaces, the services, the other, the other things that are coming along with the payment and the payment is one amount, but the things you're getting are maybe several little things. Some of them are little, some of them are bigger. Um, so why do we want to separate those rights? <laughs> That's where we get into trouble, because if we look at the rights and we say, well, some rights are a right to renew. It's an option. Some rights are rights to receive for three years. Uh, some rights are uh, the rights of the services that come along with the property. So they're all different rights, and the thing is, you know, well, if I was going to recognize each of the rights, how would I measure them based on what they are, or should I just say the whole contract is one contract and I got a contractual right?
Anyone have any questions on where I am so far? All right. Oh, don't go too fast, Ron. Um, so what is the accounting for a right of use asset? We've proposed uh, one model for all leases initially. So whether it was a three-year lease or whether it was a 30-year lease, we propose that, well, conceptually, they're all rights to use assets, and it's just the length of time, and there may be different options. And if you've got options, should we extend the period to the option period? And yes, in some cases, no in other cases. Uh, the board took a lot of heat an awful lot of heat on the original proposal. Um, some of the folks that I deal with quite a bit in the nonprofit world uh, kind of say, come on, guys, you're going to record this asset, present value it, discount it, have a stream of payments that's basically a discounted amount. We're not going to have rent expense any longer on a flow. We're going to have interest and amortization of the asset. Our users, the donors and the bankers we deal with as nonprofits, they're not going to understand that. That's not what we're looking for. And then, you know, come on, we have a three-year lease and, and we have an option because we want to be flexible. We don't want to necessarily stay here for 20 years. That's why we go short term. That's why we retain the flexibility. We heard from the hospitals. They got major equipment, but they don't necessarily want to own the equipment for 10 years. They may only want the first three or four years because technology kind of keeps making the equipment obsolete faster than you, you can turn around. Somebody's got a new gizmo to do more and better. So you hear all of these things and you kind of start to say, well, wait a minute, what about the flexibility? I kind of look at uh, the example of the, the congressman who's only got a two or three year term and he wants office space only for two or three years because he doesn't know if he's going to have a need for that office two or three years out. So he's got a two-year lease. He's not going to have rent for two years. He's going to have some kind of underlying asset, right, to use. So some people look at that and say, no, you know, this one single model doesn't really reflect the economics because you're going from one extreme to the other extreme where I'm only renting for a short period. Um, and the flexibility is what's important, not the, the longevity. So the board circled the wagons after hearing from the commentators and came out with two models based on a consumption approach. And that is, are you consuming the significant portion of the asset? And this starts to sound like Statement 13. Um, and if so, then you're under a model that's similar to what was proposed and you've got interest expense and the, the financing of a capital asset. Uh, or is it really a rather insignificant portion of the asset that you're consuming? If so, then you've got basically, we're not calling it operating, but we're calling it type A and type B because we haven't figured out what to call it. Uh, but you basically got almost operating lease treatment, so you're still going to get straight line expense. Um, I don't know how we get there. You know, that's, that's where we're at, but the board struggled with it. But the problem is that if you really break it down as a contract, and we're trying to take the contract and simplify it to kind of account for it. And instead of accounting for all the rights and obligations, what's the value of the option right? What's the value of the services I'm getting? What's the value of the space I'm getting? What's the value of the security guards? What's the value of the, the ambience of the campus that the property's on? It's, you know, we can't, as accountants, seem to deal with accounting for all of those rights, either some of them are insignificant or it's just too complex, raises valuation issues. Uh, so we try to boil it down and say, well, let's account for the whole thing as a bundle. That's part of our problem here, is we're trying to simplify. But when we get down to the bundle, we got all of these leases that vary. The only thing I say that's the same about them is they got the word lease at the top of the contract. But then you got pages of terms and conditions some without option rights, some with option rights. Some with right of first refusal, 
some with economically important option rights with very favorable terms, others with not so favorable terms. So you got all sorts of things going on in there, but basically what we come at is we're trying to get at this and then you're trying to get practical and that's where we get in trouble. So conceptually it's easy to deal with, oh yeah, there's an asset, apply the definition, there's a liability, apply the definition, then you put it out there for the rest of the world and you kind of say, ah, ah, get real is the, is the reaction. The board's dealing it with from the lessor side. The lessor side did, didn't present the same problems because a lessor typically had an asset on its balance sheet when it owned it and then it was leasing it out. It raises questions of derecognition as to whether the value of the asset that it had just went down because it was leased out or whether it still got the asset and now has a new right to receive and an obligation to make use of part of its asset. Uh, but the same issues come up but maybe not of the same degree of importance in terms of the off-balance sheet issue that started the whole effort. So those are some of the kinds of questions the board goes through. Um, and, and when you look at these, you kind of say, well, I got a right to, if I say I got a right to receive the use of an asset over time and that space, you say, how does that differ from a forward contract? If I've got a right to receive bushels of corn, you know, six months from now, what's the difference? You know, we, we, we go into these things we got options, we got forward contract accounting, we got unit of account issues, you know, this is perfect. The, the contract's got a lot of different things in it, so the question is, is are we accounting for one unit or the multiple parts? We got the contingent rentals in there, how do we measure those? Because we got the rents are going to go up, we got rentals that are contingent upon performance. If you're in a retail outlet, your, your sales volume may affect your rent payments. So we've got a number of things that present measurement issues. I think I just went over a couple of these that I want to kind of get through. Unit of account. The unit of account, our conceptual framework really doesn't help us there. Uh, the conceptual framework, I say, is still incomplete. It's good to a point, but it doesn't answer every question for us. When we get into linkage, um, we sometimes have these, and I, I characterize these as receivables and payables between parties. You kind of get into the question of netting, which would then offset the whole effort to get the asset and the liability on the books, but some people say if you've got a contract between two parties, maybe you should just net them and not show the gross. Well, that would defeat the purpose, but we get into those questions as well when we get into these uh, receivables payables. Um, I don't know about the business model or whether that comes in, but sometimes we get into these issues of uh, what's the asset? I, I use the good example, sometimes we all know what the asset is. Um, I've got a Dell computer at home, I've got a HP laptop at home. I know what the asset is, the Dell computer or the HP laptop. But if you're HP, that asset's inventory, if it's for sale. But if you're in the accounting department of HP and you've got the HP, it's now a fixed asset. So it's easy to identify the asset, but then we get into the issues of, well, what, how's the asset being used, and that's the intent, and we get into these business model questions of whether intent matters. Uh, some people say intent, and they go ballistic. Um, they say, oh, that's just an open invitation to management to move things around. But quite frankly, a lot of our classification is based on how you're using the asset. So whether it's an investment short term or whether it's long term is based on what your plans are may not be that you'll actually use it that way, but that's based on your plans. Um, this project, the conceptual framework project now, is, is a, has been a joint project with the ISB, and many of you may know that we recently revised CON 
concept statement one and two and created concept statement eight. And that was another project that was on, I forgot to mention. <laughs> Uh, over, the, over my 30 years, I've been on several projects, but the project to revise Concepts 1 and uh, 2 is one of those joint projects with the ISB. Uh, but after we got through that, the board was getting bogged down on trying to finish a number of the MOU, or Memorandum of Understanding projects that were joint, that was identified in 2006. So some things kind of got put on the back burner. The conceptual framework was one. Uh, both boards are trying to reactivate that right now. Um, the one thing that I thought was missing from the slide deck, and I added this one at the end, was we asked the question, what's the asset? But the part of the problem is that we have a definition of an asset. I think I know what an asset is. You probably know what an asset is, right? You know what an asset is, right? But are we all using the same definition? That's where we also get into trouble, because we get into arguments with people, and we get into the thing is, what's the asset? I had the, the great experience of dealing with uh, statements 116 and 117 for nonprofits and trying to move the world of nonprofit accounting from various fund accounting different, across different industries uh, and dealing with the asset. And one of the assets we thought were the you know, the works of art, the historical treasures, the ones that are in your local museum. Um, we thought that was an asset. I mean, would you, would you go up to a nice Van Gogh and look at it and appreciate it and even pay to get into the museum maybe to see it? Sounds like an asset. We all thought it was an asset. Uh, but boy, quite a bit of problem. At the end of the day, we all said it was an asset. Uh, even the museums that kind of came and with their guns said it was an asset, but boy, you aren't going to make us recognize those things and have to value them. And besides which, Ron, they're going to be a fixed asset, and we count for fixed assets at cost. Some of these things we got 100 years ago. That cost, how relevant is that in today's day and age? You know, Harvard University, I think, has been around longer than any of us. Um, probably the oldest corporation in the country. Probably has some land that it got maybe I don't know if it was $24 or not, but, uh, but probably very, very nominal. Probably still on their books for that very nominal dollar. But they probably bought some other, bought some other properties or got them as gifts. But the issues we get into is how can we say, here's a statement of financial position and leave out assets? You know, we're supposed to have completeness. The conceptual framework would tell us you should have it. Uh, at the end of the day, the board also has to try to balance costs and benefits. So when you talk to bankers and you say, well, you guys have been, without these assets on the balance sheet, you've been making loans to these museums for years. Um, do you need the asset on the books or not? And the bankers kind of tell you, well, yeah, we've been making loans for years. We don't look to the works of art to collect our loans. We don't expect them to liquidate that. We look to the cash flows. Lollapalooza? Gallopapalooza? <laughs> Gallop. We look at the cash flows. We look to what degree they're generating cash flows from the admissions and contributions and the other things. We're not going to ask them to liquidate the work. Plus, those works of art were probably given with donations and strings and restrictions on them that they can't sell them. Or if they sell them, they're just going to have to put it, use the cash for another work of art, another product another uh, work of art or historical treasure or whatever is in that museum. So at the end of the day, the board did say, wait a minute, now if the users don't think they need it on the balance sheet, why are we taking all this heat? And eventually they relaxed and kind of gave, gave the museums an option. You know, if you want to capitalize them, capitalize them. Just if you're going to do it, do it for a, the whole collection. If you're not going to do it, don't do it for any, don't pick and choose. Um, that clearly is a violation of the conceptual framework that says, yeah, there's an asset there and we have the notion of completeness. But then we got this other overriding principle that the, the benefits have to justify the costs. That too is in the conceptual framework. That is the hardest decision I think the board, you know, in my view, that the seven of them, because they each come to the table, each board member, with their own perceptions of what the benefits of the information are and what the costs of the information are. And I would say to you that when you go out into practice, if you go to work for General Motors, Ford, 
nonprofit organization, a government, and you're dealing with FASB or GASB, you too are going to have your own judgments about the benefits and costs. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I find that over the years that most people approach it very parochial from their own perspective. What's the benefit to my company rather than the benefits to my shareholders and my potential shareholders or to the public that I'm communicating with? So the board members are looking at it from that broader perspective of how does the public benefit the potential shareholder who's going to buy or the shareholder who's thinking of selling. Um, but that the cost benefit is the tough one. But that's our asset definition. That one is not very easy to understand. Assets are probable, used not like FAS5 or the codification uses it, but used like Webster uses probable. Future economic benefits, the asset is, exists. It's right in front of me. Now we're talking about the future. Obtained or controlled by a particular entity as a result of past transactions or events. Um, I think I understand it, but when we're communicating with the outside world, that doesn't go over very easily. But that's the current definition. One of the objectives of the project is to see if we can make that more intuitive, and more helpful to everyone. Liabilities, probable future sacrifices of economic benefits arising from present obligations. So here, present obligations, the lease contract, the lease contract, is it obligating us? Is it a present obligation? I'm going to make a future payment as a result of a past transaction. I signed the lease contract, the past transaction. So you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, is it a present? I don't have to make the payment now. I have to receive, when I receive the space, I'll have to make the payment. Do I have a present obligation or not? You know, and we struggle with that. So we try to deal with leases, and then we look to the conceptual framework, and we look to the asset and liability definition, and it's not crystal clear. So those are the kinds of things we struggle with at the board. Um, hopefully, as you now leave these halls of wisdom here, and you've, you take with you some of the knowledge from your professors, and you go out there, this will just help you kind of think through when you face an issue. Say, well, how might I approach it? And maybe. You know, maybe starting with this kind of sequencing will help you think about that. Um, before I go on to just some other things about us, let me just see if any other question or any questions. We haven't had another one yet. Any questions on the? Just one quick question, Ron. Could you? Um, and this sounds kind of stupid in a way, but why does this matter? Um, you know, like on the, the, the leasing issue. Why does it matter if we break the lease down? And Perspective, it may be hard to see uh, why that really does make a difference, yeah. why the FASB spends so much time talking about it. Well, I think for me, one of them, I think, is the measurement problem. We don't measure all our assets the same way. Some of them are at cost, some of them are net realizable value, some are at present value, uh, fair value. So we, because we measure some assets one way, other assets another way, figuring out what the asset is is important to know, well, how should we be measuring it? Now, if we measured all assets at fair value, maybe it wouldn't matter so much. But is the world ready to move all assets at fair value? The other thing the conceptual framework doesn't really answer for us is what's our measurement objective? So when we look at financial statements, well, what are we trying to do? I mean, what does net income really measure? Does it measure anything, or is it just the result of a bunch of additions and subtractions? Uh, you know, they're all just all hodgepodge of different measurements that are going on, and we come into net income, and then we have a certain few items that go into other comprehensive income. But we don't have an objective as to what we're trying to get at from a measurement objective. So for me, right now, the reason this is important as to whether we break it apart is because we measure different assets. So if a contract is a bundle of rights, are all of those rights the same? If they're all intangible assets and they all get measured as intangible assets, it doesn't really matter much. But if part of them are going to get measured like a fixed asset, and part of them are going to get measured like an intangible, and part of them are going to get measured as a receivable, and how do we measure an option right? Yeah. 
and some of them are going to be fair valued. I mean, then we've got, by bundling it all as one to simplify it, then we got the problem of, well, now that you got this bundle of hodgepodge, how do you want to measure that contractual right? So. And then it really goes to the user of the financial yeah. report. At the end of the day, um, and I'm dealing with this right now. We just had an issue last week. We're dealing with nonprofit cash flow statement. And you know, I understand what the indirect method of cash flow is reconciliation from in the business environment, we go from net income to cash flow from operations. In the nonprofit world, we start with change in net assets, and we go down to change in, uh, cash flow from operations. So we segregate the financing and the investing activities. I know what the indirect method does. I know that when I go out and I talk to analysts, I know that they're trying to back out from net income to come up with some, some notion of EBITDA or free, free cash flows or some other metric. Basically, what users are doing are trying to look typically at an industry and come up with a common benchmark. And this way they can kind of look at different investment opportunities with a common benchmark. Well, that's what all this financial reporting is for, is hopefully for those who are potential investors in the company or divestitures and current investors who are thinking of selling off. I mean, all of this is really for them. Internally, I mean, I worked for Union Carbide before I worked in public accounting and before I was at the FASB. Internally, you know, we had accounting policy groups. We figured out what our contracts were. We figured out how we were going to deal with conversion contracts if, if we had an exchange with Monsanto. And we, we kind of got into the contractual rights. So we had our understandings and we kind of worked out the policies to how to move product around. Managerial accounting is a whole different ballgame from where the FASB is. Cost accounting has its place, but cost accounting is part of good managerial accounting. So, you know, we're not in that management accounting, so when we kind of think about where you go, you're going to have, well, what do you need to do for the company? What do you need to do for the IRS for taxes? That's another issue. What do you need to do for other compliance if you've got contracts with the government? So you've got contract accounting. And then what do you do for your share shareholders, your lenders? You've got, you're probably going to have bond issuances, so you've got debt holders as well. So what are you doing for them? That's the world we're interested in. So one of the things and the reason for joint projects with the ISB is that in an ideal world, geographic boundaries shouldn't mean anything. I mean, as accountants and providing financial information, does it matter whether we're in Kentucky today or you know, Florida tomorrow? You know, hopefully we're, we can deal with the same language of accounting and financial reporting, no matter what state we're in, no matter what country we're in. Go down to Mexico, go up to Canada, go down to Latin America, go across the rest of the world. So the, the ISB's effort is trying to get some greater harmony across geographic boundaries. Our work with them is part of that effort. Um, but you know, that's an ideal world. And we get cost-benefit issues and we get concerns and they're coming from the U.S. companies that beat up on us. They're getting it from everybody across the whole world that beats up on them. Um, hopefully we help each other you know, by kind of working together and developing ideas and issues. You guys, you know, I have, I have four, 14 interns, is, is what we used to call them, <laughs> in the old day, postgraduate technical assistants. That's harder to say. But those are the youth of America coming out of college, going right up to the FASB for one year. We have 14 of them with us right now. When I first started, the program probably had about eight. It's expanded over the years, which is a good thing. It says that the program works. The program works, they help us, we help them. They typically come to us for a year, bring the open-mindedness that you guys bring, um, help us old-timers stay young, uh, keep us challenging us with new ideas, uh, and then move on to public accounting, law, or academe, or, or wherever they go. They, they 
they go off to do other things. And some of them come back to us later on as fellows. Fellows typically come to us for two years, usually out of public accounting, but they can come out of industry, they can come out of academe. When they come out of academe, it's usually one year, because they usually have their sabbatical and then they want to get off and on back to the academic world. But the fellow program is useful. We've actually got our former chairman, Leslie Seidman, was a, was a fellow before she was a board member. Uh, she was a fellow, then she was on the staff, and then she was eventually FASB chairman, uh, chairwoman, I guess. But, uh, you know, so the fellowship program is useful. The EITF, uh, Emerging Issues Task Force, that helps us with what I call the rifle shot issues, not the big issues. Leases is a big issue, big project. We get some issues that are real narrow. Um, those go to the Emerging Issues Task Force. You, we tend to find that the fellows, some of them go back to their national office and then become, move up in the ranks and they're back to us as members of the EITF. Uh, some of our board members were former EITF members. So there's a, a, a good group of, I don't know if apostles is the right word, but we kind of bring folks through that come through the FASB and then go off, you know, and do other things that hopefully help tell the story of what we're trying to do. Uh, good programs. Uh, of the 14, I didn't see anybody from Louisville. The, the program is very competitive. I mean, I look at, <laughs> I was on the interviewing committee this past year and I'm looking at resumes and I'm saying, what happened to me when I was going to school? Look at these grade point averages. I don't know. I mean, four O's, three nine fives, three nines. Um, it, it real talented groups nominated by their faculty, typically only one person coming out of any one school at any one semester. Right now, we actually have two folks from Wake Forest, one who came six months ago, one who came more recently. Um, but, boy, we've had real good luck with Brigham Young. We've had one now. We've got another one coming in. And those are we've had, they paid. Those are paid positions, yeah. They're, they're, um, typically, those are folks like you that already had an offer to go to public accounting uh, and decide to delay that for a year come to us and then go either to the firm that gave them an offer or they find that when they get to us, <laughs> the firms are whining and dining them <laughs> quite a bit trying to get them to change their mind to go with a different firm. You know, so, um, great program, uh, not one that's easy to get into, but one that's worth you know, looking. I, I've got two folks, I think, that came, to, came from schools that never had anybody in the program last year that came in this year. So that's something I'd like to kind of, one of the reasons why I wanted to get here is at least plant a seed. Uh, if it's not for you, that's fine. Uh, it's not for you. But if it is something you're interested in, then talk to your faculty members. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's information on the website as well. You know, the FASB website. You know, to me, that's, it's a marvel that how much information is available there now, because, you know, when you go back to the, the old days, cut and paste really meant cut and paste. <laughs> uh, we, used <to> work <laughs> we used to actually work with scissors and tape uh, in the old days doing comment letter analyses. Now you've got databases and it's much easier to process comment letters, even when they get over a thousand letters, that you can deal with them a little bit more efficiently. Um, but they're good programs. Um, anybody got any questions about those programs or anything else we're doing? Uh, yes. Um, back to so he, uh, operating capital leases. If you look at it now, you know, there's the possibility of taking advantage of it. Um, and if you did break it down, you know, to you know, 20 parts is one lease and valued each one, doesn't that add to more possible places that, you know, someone could take advantage of your valuations? Yeah, and I, the question really gets down, if you broke the lease contract down further into multiple parts, would that create more problems? I suspect it would. I think particularly when we get into fair value for things that aren't traded and for which valuation becomes very subjective, there certainly is opportunity to 
play some games there. Um, it seems like yeah, yeah. yeah. Th there's just there's there's a lot of problems, um, some of which we can't solve with the county standards, and you know we have to face up to. It. I think you guys probably experienced the foundation in this area that had a fraud recently where you know people abscond with the assets you know there's assets so we've got some bad players out there and we're not going to fix the world when we've got bad players hopefully they get caught and that gets dealt with then when we get down to those who are actually good players trying to do the right thing that's where we worry I mean you know you're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to get to fair value, you're trying to get to some other measure, and you're doing a good conscious effort, and yet you're being second-guessed by somebody else who comes in. Now, you haven't gone through this, but you're going to go through peer review programs if you're in public accounting, so you're going to have somebody else coming in with hindsight. You know, it's like that referee who goes and looks underneath the, you know, with looks at the tape and says, okay, I'll make another judgment. Now I'm going to second guess my colleague who made the call. Um, none, of, but none of the folks in public accounting like to be second guessed. None of the folks in private accounting like to be second guessed. So the private guys don't like to be second guessed by the publics who come in to do the audits. The auditors don't like to be second guessed by the PCAOB or by peer review. Um, quite frankly, the standards should be easy enough that you know, you can apply them, but at the same time, we can't dumb down to make them so easy that they achieve nothing. Um, I can recall a meeting of our financial accounting advisory, uh, standards advisory council. I think your dean uh, was on our FASAC. But I can remember uh, Catherine Shipper, who's now a professor down at Duke, was, was on FASAC at the time, before she became a board member, and grumbling around the room, talking about a potential project. I don't, know, I don't think it was leases, but it was a, a project. And you know, everybody around the room, going around this big table, about 25 members around a big table. And it was gripe after gripe after gripe after gripe after gripe. And it got to Catherine, and she finally got the floor, and she says, I didn't realize that this was the Easy Accounting Standards Board. And, uh, you know Catherine? <laughs> she, she silenced the room. Nobody had a gripe after that. <laughs> and, you know, it's, we have some tough issues to deal with. The board members try to deal with them, but then it is that balancing act of costs and benefits, and, one of the things about costs are, you know, what's the cost to get the, the information? Will we get there? Will we be satisfied with it? You know, is it going to be a fair representation no matter what we do? Are we capable of dealing with it? You know, in the old days before I started, we didn't have other post-employment benefits on the balance sheet. Was that an easy issue? No. Was it an important issue? Yes. If you think about pension accounting and the governments that are in trouble, you know, maybe a better job of getting the measure on the balance sheet would have helped manage. As one board member said, if you don't measure it, you don't manage it. So you know, that there's those kinds of dilemmas. So the board members have to work with the, the balancing act. It's not, a, it's not easy. They have, a, they have a tough job. But eventually, they've got to make a vote, and they've got to decide and move on. Other questions? Yep. like 10, 15 years ago, and I still have this question. If you can go back, one slide shows the definition of the assets. It says assets are proper future economic benefit. I have a question about this word. What is the, you know, the proper mean? It has, it has nothing to do with the calculation of a probability. No. You know, I'm just wondering whether it doesn't it matter to have this word in the definition. There's a there's a footnote, there's a footnote in the conceptual framework to that word. I put it in italics because I didn't want to put the whole footnote up here. But the footnote basically refers you back to Webster's dictionary. 
for probable. Basically, that which you would normally expect to happen. You know, if I dealt with uh, in the contribution world what was called pledges. Now, pledges were things, maybe some people said a statement of intention. Some people said they were promises. And what we found is that people use the word, but they use it very differently for various things. But when you had a promise to give from a donor, and it was unconditional, we said, you know what? It's a probable future economic benefit as a result of the past transaction, the promise. It was probable. People really are expected to make good on their pledges and their promises. I mean, that's part of our contract world. We make promises to each other. People are expected to make good. Sure, some people renege and receivables go bad, but we try to deal through that with measurement with allowances for doubtful accounts, not through non-recognition. So what we're trying to do is recognize what you, what you normally would expect, what is probable in the, in the Webster's Dictionary sense of it, not in a FAS 5, you know, is it 75% likely, is it more likely than not, is it, not in a real technical sense. But, as I said earlier, we put that definition up and it doesn't, it doesn't communicate with everybody, it doesn't hit home. So I look at a promise, and it's unconditional, sorry, <laughs> and I think it's good. I go through some research and I find that in many states, courts do uphold promises because it's good practice to hold people to their promises. Some, some go through various theories of detrimental reliance. Did you rely on the promise? Did you do anything? If there was no reliance, they might not uphold. Dif different states, different law there. We basically came down and applied the definition and said, look, people make promises. They're unconditional. You should recognize the asset. Whether it's a verbal or a written promise didn't really matter from an evidence point. But we did get hung up with, well, did they make a promise or did they only state what they intend to give you? Your church asks you, how much do you intend to give next year so that they can do budgeting? Nah, I intend to give. I didn't promise to give. Well, we said those words do matter. They make a difference. But once you've got a promise, you've got, but not everybody agrees. But that's where we came out. But again, it's not a FAS-5 technical sense, so I, all I can say is kind of go back and look at the conceptual framework in CON-6, and then you'll see the footnote attached to that, which will just take you back to our English dictionary. Uh, hi. You uh, made reference to the Government Accounting Standards Board. I was wondering, how are the standards that FASB sets compared to the uh, GASB? Like, what would be the largest difference? <laughs> oh, God, good question. I'm not sure I could answer the largest difference. There are differences, um, and we hear about that quite a lot from colleges and universities, because we have colleges and universities like Louisville that are public. We have the private colleges that follow FASB standards. Uh, we have the same thing with hospitals. Um, there are some things that GASB has done, like statement of cash flows for public universities and hospitals, and they required the direct method years ago. So they were out way in front of us. We're just coming around to just a proposal. We haven't even exposed it yet for comment. And I've already gotten calls from the private colleges. Why are you doing that? You're moving too quickly. And I, I chuckle when someone says we're moving too quickly because I've been there for 30 years and I don't recall ever moving very quickly. <laughs> we don't move quickly. We, we move at a snail's pace, very deliberately. Um, there, are, there are many differences. Pension accounting, I think, is one where they're now kind of bringing their standards more up, but then we're looking at it again and saying maybe we need to do some improvement again. That's one of those standards where no boards really bit the, bu the bullet 
and jumped to what they really thought. They kind of incrementally moved the world along. Um, they did some real good work on their Statement 34, Measurement Basis of Accounting. Um, when I first arrived in 83, the GASB was just being formed. Um, concepts 4 contemplated that FASB would be dealing with that sector. Um, we were dealing with pension accounting. They had, the, the governments had no interest whatsoever in where the FASB was going with pension accounting, so I think that was the straw that caused the creation of the GASB to begin with. Plus, plus the GASB, plus the states had some question about why would a private, not-for-profit organization like the Financial Accounting Foundation, which is the corporate umbrella for the FASB, why would they be setting standards for states? Shouldn't we be doing it for ourselves? So they were interested in forming their own board. Eventually, they decided you know, it would be best to have a new board, but under the same corporate umbrella. Um, we hear from the colleges and universities, you know, we're one industry, we'd like to have one set of standards. Um, I find that even when I talk to them, and I mentioned to Bill that, you know, last week I was at the University of Chicago, a meeting of the controllers and financial offices of some of the big private universities. I find that where we left some options and choices in our standards, even though they talk that they would like everybody to be accounting for it the same way, I find that, you know, University of Chicago's doing one thing and Yale's doing something else where they had choice. And, you know, we expected the trade associations to kind of help get the industries together, but they haven't been able to push it. Uh, so we have differences, even not so much the standards, just in the ch where we've left choice in the selections that happen. I, I think, and I may be wrong, but I think GASB um, was coming from a world of fund accounting and more of a budget emphasis, particularly at the local level, where the budget was the dominant player to set the tax rate. And a lot of the accounting was focused on more the budget rather than, and I would say almost like, you know, I don't know whether that's internal reporting or whether that's external reporting. I got into it before, whether that's really reporting to the citizenry. Because when you're doing the budget, usually the year's not over. So then you get into the accountability emphasis. There are differences, but those differences have been narrowing rather than expanding, in my view, over the years. And I just think that two boards in two different time zones. I mean, one, it's the same thing with the ISB and the FASB. We, we don't have everything the same. That's why we had some joint projects. We're coming at it from a different stage of development. So you kind of get into this, if you're always in the stage of trying to improve on what you have, your improvement may create a difference from where another board is. Now that's a tension point. But can we all just stay where we are and not think about improvement, that doesn't sound right either. So I'm not sure if I answer. I, I, I don't think I can technically answer. I'm not sure that I know what the biggest difference is. Uh, they're like the nonprofits, don't have a net income metric. So that causes some differences as well. Uh, my question is kind of about a different topic. I was just curious uh, what actions or uh, rules that FASB instituted after the financial uh, meltdown in 2007 and 2008 to make banks and financial institutions more accurately uh, reflect their transactions uh, in the market that before were off the balance sheet and weren't realized until they had to write down uh, losses uh, after the instruments went bad. I'm not sure that we're done. <laughs> I know we're not done, because we still have some financial instrument projects on the agenda that we're trying to work through. Uh, as I said, we don't necessarily move quickly. Uh, there were a few EITFs, I think, early on, but the, um, the impairment project on bank loans, uh, financial instrument and impairment, uh, 
the two boards, the ISB and the FASB, have not gotten to the same place, so that's slowed both of them down. Um, one of the difficulties is working with seven board members is challenging enough for the staff. Working with two boards, and you've got another board with 14 to 16 members, and you've got your own board with seven members, and you don't add the votes of each of them together and just add them up, you've got to vote separately each board. Uh, when you go on to different paths and you get to different places, that slows the whole thing down. I mean, it's, it really is a slow effort. Um, most of the problems, I think, are more from the, uh, the bank regulators are being addressed rather than the financial reporting. There are financial reporting issues, too. And part of the criticism was that the loan losses were being recognized too late. Of course, we get at it and we start pushing the envelope and then they say, well, now you're going to recognize them too soon. So, uh, so you know, and it, and it's not right if you, over, if you start overly reserving and then you're taking it back into income later, you know, why did you reserve it? Uh, so, and this is part of the measurement problems. You know, it's not easy to, I think it was Yogi Berra that said, not easy to predict the future. Something to that effect. It, it's not. You know, you're trying to come up with allowances for doubtful accounts that haven't gone totally bad yet. And they may be starting to look like they're going to go bad, but you know, are they going to turn around or not turn around? And if you're going out into the audit profession, you're going to have to check to see if the judgments that the preparers are making are reasonable, at least, within bounds. Uh, but we haven't finished our work on financial instruments. We're still struggling. Um, I just had a quick question. I was wondering if um, there were two or three essential um titles or authors that we should be reading in the field of accounting? I'll leave that one for your professors. You know, I, 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 I find Reed Story's little special report that he's done very helpful to me where I'm at, and that's available through the FASB. I have a copy of but, that. Um, yeah, I just find that it's useful to go back and look at that and refresh myself, because sometimes I lose my way. You, know, you need to come back home, uh, and I find that helpful. But God, there's so many research reports that come out. I, you know, I don't know contemporaneously if there's any one. I, you know, Mary Barth was on the ISB. Uh, Catherine, I know from the FASB, um, yeah, but I don't, I don't know the academics very well. And you know, if you if you really want, I'd say talk to your professors or send an email to Tom Linsmeyer on the FASB board, and maybe Tom will have a suggestion for you as which academics he respects that would be worth reading. Some of them may be dead. You know, they they it could be books from the past uh, that are worth reading and going back and looking at. What is it like? Do you think from a PTA's perspective, what's it like working at the board? Um, I think they, it's sort of like, you know, you have your classmates and you kind of have your different years that you started with. And they come in, they come in basically the January group and the July, August group. You know, they, they come in basically with the semester kind of breaks. <clears throat> and they have their core group. And, you know, we've got the FAF volleyball team, the FAF softball team. The softball team won in Norwalk this year. Why? Not because of old timers at the FASB. It's because we get these PTAs that come out and actually can hit the ball. <laughs> you know, they, they have these things that you know, go on, so it's not just you know, but you the do, think you tank. But you interact with yeah. board members? I have the staff member that's working for me right now. Uh, we had a conversation last week and the week before on a particular issue that's going to be his issue. You know, he did some research. We had to have a quick survey. Board members had an educational meeting. They weren't ready to make a decision. They wanted some more outreach. We had done quite a bit of outreach through phone calls and what have you. He said, can you do some more? Boom. We have a, a mailing list of about 277 folks, and we just sent out a blast with a survey monkey. Boom. Three days later, he's got results. He's presenting it to the board. Now, you know, would I be able to do that? I don't even know what these tools are. <laughs> they got these tools at their fingertips. You guys have the technology. It's, it's 
moves, it moves so quick. I mean, I finally got an iPhone, but... <laughs> how, many, how many are on the staff right now, do you know, offhand? Uh, the FASB's got, now with XBRL uh, team, 75 staff members. Or that 75, that may actually include the board members, 75 on the roster. And I think about 150, 170 maybe in the whole organization, which is the FAF corporate, which deals with publications department, the accounting department for the organization, the, the, uh, you know, the corporate printing, publishing, website, all the administrative functions. Uh, but the FASB staff is probably down to more like, without XBRL, is probably about 45 to 50 folks. It's not, a, it's not that big a group. Yeah, I mean, it's, really, it's similar to a, a good-sized accounting yeah, firm you mean, office. 14 of the, 14 are PTAs right out of school, one year. So they, you know, I used to say when I first got there, I think I was under 40 at that time. I used to say, oh, the interns are about half my age. Mmm. <laughs> now they're about a third. <laughs> May I ask a it's, question about the PTA program? Sure. Um, if there is a student or two in here who's thinking, man, that sounds kind of cool, and I've still got a couple years left, you were just looking at applications. What makes an application stand out? What are some of the things that you've seen that, um, that students could really start doing now that, in addition to just preparing them to be better in their careers, might also give them a leg up yeah. at the FASB? Uh, I find, and it's for me only, and I can't speak for everyone, but. I think there were about five of us that were reviewing resumes, and I looked at, I looked at all of them this year. Uh, I find that, yeah, the grade point average kind of is like one of the things right up there at the top of the line, you know, and, and what, you, what your majors were. Um, but I find that the other activities that you're involved in help to kind of, whether it's activities in student activities or whether it's community activities, that shows that you're really going beyond just the, the books that you're doing something, uh, and the leadership, but you know, that's, that's something I'm sure you know. Um, clearly this program is more than just the paper on the, you know, the resume. This one, the nomination is important too. Um, we have, you know, faculty members who we know who have been on FASAC and have been, I mean, I've got a former FASB chairman who's now teaching down at Georgia who sends a candidate and this year was the first time we had to turn down his candidate. I mean, that's not easy when your former chairman who you worked with, and you know you're going to see, because he's going to be back up in our offices on occasion. Um, it's, it's very competitive, um, but, you know, I think all of them that we get, they can take it. They've already had offers, <laughs> so it's, it's not like they're coming that this is make or break. Um, it's hard, because you look at, them all, and I say, geez, every one of them is qualified. So how do you, how do you select? So interviewing and how you come across on the interview is going to mean something. So I would say that you got nothing to lose because it's just one more interview, and if you're still in the interviewing process, well, that's going to be one more, uh, and it's just another life experience. So there's nothing to lose. No. And I, I was not in the PTA program, but um, the other thing I'll say is that I think you get a <coughs> perspective that you can get no place else. Wouldn't you agree, Ron? Yeah, I. Um, I mean, I think you truly get a user perspective yeah. Uh, yeah. at the board. Yeah, I I do think uh, you know that is when you think about it and you think about a corporation, you kind of think about well, how are we going to make money. Well, how we're going to make money is serving our customers, making the products that the customers want and the focus is on the customer. For us, the customer is the user of the financial statement. So, you know, it's the shareholders in, in the nonprofit arena, it's the, the bankers and the donors, the big grant makers, they're the ones that use the financials, not the little donors who don't even look at the financials, they don't really care about the financials, they just care about the organization maybe, but not the financials. But the big donors, uh, the, so, you know, you're, Shareholders, bondholders, lenders, banks, uh, and we have private companies too, so we've got not necessarily public shareholders only, we've got to think about the private companies as well. Uh, but yes, the PTAs do get 
they kind of go through this orientation of, you know, trying to understand how the board thinks, the conceptual framework, trying to make the case for whatever position we're, whatever issue we're dealing with, how does it relate to the conceptual framework? Uh, so they get, they, they do get, but we're not gonna indoctrinate them in one year and <laughs> necessarily change them that much. Um, I just have a quick comment about the FASB board, how quickly they find, you know, academic, academic research. I, this last weekend, I came back from the CAR conference, Contemporary Accounting Research Conference in Canada. I just a quote, you know, the discussant, that is Robert uh, Bluefield from Cornell University. He said, uh, the FASB just have really funny taste about academic research. If the result is if the result support the FASB decisions, and they can very quickly find that research. If it's not, they're probably not going to find that research at all. Yeah. Do you have I, any comments? I, um, we, our library, and what well, you guys, you, know, you get those emails from the, uh, with all of the research papers that come in daily. And so I see them daily. Uh, I look at quickly the headlines and the, the abstract, maybe if the headline grabs me. Um, our academic fellow, when we have one on board, helps us to try to go through and say, well, which academic research is relevant to the issues we're dealing with? Because not everything is relevant to what we're dealing with. You guys focus, and I don't know how you do it, but you focus on stock movements and you try to take a specific thing and you try to relate it, and I look at it and I says, my God, there's so many things that make prices move. How can you isolate it? I don't know how you do it. But you, you look at a paper, and I look at it, and I look at the abstract, I look at the beginning, I can read that, then I get into the statistics, the stats, and I get lost, and I get to the conclusion, which kind of repeats what was in the abstract, and I can understand that. So I find that if I look at something and I say, I think this is relevant, let me go talk to the academic fellow to help make, interpret it for me. Some board members are academics, Tom Linsmeyer. Many of them, you know, they kind of come through, but it's usually only one board member that's an academic. So he becomes a translator in a sense to try to take some of the research and say, oh yeah. The folks at Cornell and the program uh, try to help, I think, you guys understand what might be relevant to the FASB, because I think the academics want to try to find work that would, would be relevant to the FASB, some of them. But not everything you do is relevant to a standard setting project at the time. So I just find that a lot of it, you know, and of course this doesn't help me with the nonprofits, but a lot of it is focused on movement and prices of stock and trying to isolate time periods and events and what moves it, and I just find Okay, well that's interesting, but does that, what does that do for standards? It might help us on disclosures if there's certain pieces of information that would move. Some of that stuff, however, that you do is sort of after we've already done something. You look at a period before some information was available, and then you look at a period just after the information was available, to, or when it came out, how did it move prices? that train may have already left from a standard setting perspective. So, you know, I don't know how to, you know, answer you directly. Some of it, I find, I look at it and I say, some of it, I think this could be helpful to me. Met much of it, I look at the headline and go on. And says, if somebody else thinks it's gonna be relevant, they'll bring it up. Other questions? Ta -ta -ta. Last call. Okay. All right, let him go. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Just before we break up, if there's anybody here who's from another school other than U of L, would you please just come and say hi? I just wanted to greet you, and I didn't get a chance to do that before. So thanks, everybody, for coming.